My name is Monk Grove for the Phileas Jazz Archive, and it's a privilege to be speaking with Dr. Ray Ricker this afternoon. Welcome. Thanks, Monk. Glad, uh, glad to talk with you. I had to practice this uh, a little bit, uh, that you are a classical and jazz performer, a music educator, a composer, arranger, an author, music contractor, and perhaps the quintessential example of a complete musician. Well, <laughs> we will do a lot of different things, but uh, yeah. Did you have, uh, as a teenager, what I'll call an aha moment, um, an epiphany of any sort that you remember that really directed your career path? Well, I always liked to practice. And so my parents didn't have to bug me about that. And there were a couple of things uh, along the way. I got principal clarinet in the Colorado, uh, I'm from Denver. So in the Colorado uh, Allstate, and that was a big one and uh, kind of moved me on. And I went to the University of Denver. I lived at home. It's a good school, had a good clarinet teacher and a good uh, jazz band. In fact, we were, we were sent in 1965 to, uh, to Asia. We were sent for three months on a State Department tour. And that was a result that we won the uh, Notre Dame Jazz Festival the previous year. That's when it was really a contest and and uh, and the State Department people were there and they uh, you know they liked the band. They also liked that the band was diverse. And uh, so yeah, three months touring Asia. It was a great, great uh, trip. Was the uh, jazz group considered part of the music department at that time? Because I know when I was at Fredonia in the late 60s, we had a fine jazz group, but it was um, mostly student run and uh, sometimes hard to get a space to perform in. They had an arm's length sort of relationship with it. Yeah. Well, yes, this was, uh, you got credit for it and it had a, uh, an outside director, it wasn't student run. And uh, there weren't many places in the US or probably in the world <laughs> at that time that, that gave credit. And that was sort of a big deal. Um, North Texas State was one and uh, us, University of Denver. And then some of the big 10 schools around that time, I, I remember Michigan State had a good band and they rehearsed and, you know, as part of the curriculum. But uh, really jazz education was in its in infancy at that time. And, and to play in the big band was just sort, sort of the first step. Yes, were, were you a, um, one of the players that the director might be able to point to and say, you got it, I need an improvised solo here. Yeah, I was one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I started on clarinet, and I always sort of kept the two tracks uh, separate. You know, I uh, played played clarinet, did all the legit stuff, classical stuff, and at age sixteen, I picked up the saxophone. And uh, I remember five weeks later, I played my first gig. <laughs> it was New Year's Eve. <laughs> Ah, that was my first gig too. Yeah, and the rest first is history. Lang gig. <laughs> yeah. And you so, got to you got to play Old Lang Syne for the first time. I, I wonder if you used the Guy Lombardo vibrato. <laughs> I think I was playing second tenor someplace, so I I probably did. <laughs> you know, just follow the lead guy. Did Did you feel I? Can you remember what you made that night? You know, I remember 
even a little after that in college, we would get in our cars and we would drive to Goodland, Kansas, or Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, or Cheyenne, Wyoming, or sometimes Laramie, Wyoming. You know, we drive there for 15 bucks. You know, it took us all, you know, <laughs> we go there, we left in the afternoon, play the gig, come back at night, get home around, you know, five or six in the morning. It was crazy. It's, it sure was, uh, but it, it's wonderful that we didn't think it was crazy at that time. I mean, we might have sort of complained about it, but still, it, it, there's nothing like that feeling, I guess. It, it, can you remember what your repertoire would have consisted of for those gigs? This would have been around when? That would be in the, um, the later 60s. Well, no, it could be in the early, in high school, I was there in uh, 1960. So, um, yeah, the repertoire, we played out of the combo orc books, I think they yeah. were called. Yes. You know, and, and the instrumentation worked on about, you know, <laughs> for about any number of players that you had. And then there were some... Oh, I can't re remember the, the publishers, you know, but uh, there wasn't a lot of a lot of music for us to play. In fact, by the time I got to college, you know, I mean, you had to, if you wanted to be competitive in these, the contests that we went to or the festivals, you know, you had to have some good charts and Luckily, uh, our director knew some people in Las Vegas and they uh, would had supplied us with some, some charts, some good stuff, you know, and some bassy things too. Yeah. And uh, so that's how we got our repertoire there. But just as far as high school stuff, you know, just buying things off the shelf. I mean, I think bands are still playing some of that music, you know. Yes, in those times it was... Uh... AM radio played almost anything you can imagine, but what would the group have done if someone came up, put 20 bucks, you know, in a tip jar and said, play some Sinatra? And if you didn't know any, did you have the wherewithal that you could fake it? Yeah, we probably could. Not all of us, you know, but I mean, a, a, a quartet could. Right. To play the tunes because that was one of the things we did was to to start learning tunes and we played combo gigs you know with maybe just one horn and uh, a rhythm section or sometimes two horns but mainly just one and uh, you know they, they, they we call them dance gigs and uh, so it was uh, mainly just learning tunes tunes of the day broadway tunes standards and uh, having that repertoire of, of things to do, you know, things to play. Well, I'm going to leapfrog uh, a few decades. Is learning tunes for the current jazz student as important as it was back then? The reason I'm well, asking uh, uh, is partly technology that a student now can have um, hundreds of tunes on their phone or on their iPad. Mm -hmm. And it's been my experience that they seem less inclined to memorize things. Mm. I don't know. The, the standard tunes are, it's sort of like, you know, if you're playing classical, clarinet, let's say, you still study Mozart and, you know, and Weber and older composers. And the standard tunes are sort of a, a repertoire that, that I know our students at Eastman uh, develop and, and work on. But, you know, they don't stay stuck in playing standard tunes. They're also <laughs> moving into their own thing and using that in, the information and the skills that they develop, you know, as 
as uh, you know, playing by ear and learning these different standards, they apply that to their compositions. So there's sort of a couple different tracks here. There's the tunes you would play, play um, a, a dance job. That's what we call them, okay? And then there's the jazz tunes, which were different. But you could fake it a little bit. I mean, you could, there were some crossover ones, like uh, the girl from Ipanema was one of those, <laughs> those tunes that were across. Or we would even, you know, play giant steps uh, as a uh, rumba. <laughs> this is after things had been livened up a little bit on <laughs> at the party. And, you know, you, you could slide something like that in, uh, in the middle of Besame Mucho or something yes. <laughs> as a medley. And, and you could always play a, sh a nice shuffle blues and, and get people on the dance floor that way and just oh, yeah. sort of get sure. to blow on that. Oh yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Was there a particular point that you made the decision about music as your livelihood or did it sort of just evolve like this is an obvious thing for me? Um, it, it sort of evolved, but around um, my junior year in high school, uh, I went to the Allstate Band and, and my friends were there also, the seniors that were a year older than me. And um, yeah, I just, they, they were going, being music majors and they were going to, to the University of Denver and they were getting good scholarships. And that, that's because uh, the band director had money to give. And uh, he was also a clarinetist. And I, I, my last year or so in high school, I studied with him. And, it, and he also started giving me things that the college kids didn't want to do. You know, there was a, a little pep band, a Dixieland band that played for all the hockey games. And it was uh, right above the net, you know, one of the nets. And uh, we played the fight song or whatever it was, you know, and, and we play a little bit before the, the thing started and, and we, you know, play during timeouts and stuff like that. And so um, I had that as a gig and it was, uh, you know, that my band director gave to me, which was kind of cool. I was playing with uh, college guys and I was playing clarinet at that, you know, in this group. And then he also, I ended up playing a show there once, you know, a, a Broadway show that they were staging. And so, yeah, he was recruiting me that way and it was great, you know? And so you know, that's why I went to school there. So that was, I figured, you know, I, I, music was the best thing I could do because I had no interest in anything else. And, and I didn't work very hard in anything else. I just, just mainly practiced and, uh, you know, read about music and just sort of lived that kind of thing. If you had gone out to a record store about that time when you were playing the hockey rink gig, <laughs> what might you have purchased as far as non-classical music? Non-classical. I remember pretty much my first one I got was a 10 inch 33 and a third. No, a, a 10 or a, it was a small one. Not the, maybe yes. the big one with the 10 inch. I don't know, but it, this is a smaller one. And it was Horace Silver. And it had uh, four tunes on it, you know. And uh, it, that was the first one I got. And after that, I joined the Columbia Record uh, uh, archive, you know, the uh, whatever, the one where you got a record per, you know, every month. And they just came. And sometimes you got to, to choose, you know. Yes. But there were a lot of guys that were recorded for Columbia, like Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk, and that kind of thing. So I built a record collection that way. Do you recall when you started figuring out the mystery of chord symbols and how they might apply to your improvising? 
Yeah, I do. When we got together to, to play, it was just sort of a free for all, you know, <laughs> and, and I finally figured out, oh, yeah, they're, they're playing this form. <laughs> and there's a thing called a bridge, you know, and you just don't stop, you know, play until you wear out and stop, you know, they actually follow this form. So, uh, yeah, that dawned on me. <laughs> and I started, uh, you know, listening to music more intently and uh, talking to my friends and, uh, also, at that time, my dad would would take me to uh, hear guys that would come into town, like Oscar Peterson and Buddy DeFranco and Dizzy Gillespie. And so, you know, he would take me to these, you know, their bars, nightclubs, and uh, I'd get to hear these guys. And uh, that was good. My dad wasn't a musician or anything, but he liked that music. and. Uh, and so actually my mom would go too. And sometimes my clarinet teacher would go the a clarinet teacher previous to the college one. I wonder if you ever had a private teacher that said to you, this would have been your classical teacher. I said, listen, you have to choose you I can hear this jazz thing going on in your sound on this Mozart piece, and this won't do at all. Did that ever happen to you? Uh, no, they were pretty liberal. Yeah, they were pretty liberal. Even though they were straight ahead classical teachers and performers, they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't give me a hard time about it. Um, I think I, I mainly kept things uh, separated. You know, I mean, I played Dixieland clarinet and all that kind of stuff, you know, but I never really practiced that. I, uh, you know, did all my legit stuff on clarinet and my jazz stuff on saxophone. So it was pretty much divorced. I, uh, I gleaned a lot of wonderful information from your your book, which we'll, we'll get to. I understand the Vietnam War played a role in your decision about what direction to go when you were, I guess, late teens, early 20s. Yeah, well, actually, I was a little older than that because um, I think that was, I went in the Army in 1967. Oh. And I was there, but between for three years 67 to 70 but uh, yeah i was going to get drafted and um and i had been except i already had i was finishing up my master's degree at michigan state and um i was getting ready to get married too but my um uh, deferment on the <laughs> The day I got my degree, <laughs> right after that, I think it was on the weekend, on that Monday or Tuesday, I got the uh, welcome to the Army <laughs> draft notice, you know. I went from 2S, which was student, to 1A, which was you're at the top of the list and you're going to have to, you know, you're going to get a physical. So I called uh, a friend of mine who was in the West Point band and I said, what's going on at West Point? How do, how do you... What, what's going there? He says, oh, it's really a good thing. It's, you know, 40 miles from New York, and we go down, we take lessons in New York, and, and the work is not hard at all. You got a lot of free time and stuff, and you go in as a rank as a sergeant, and you get to stay there for three years. I said, well, man, I how do I get into that? He said, you got to audition. And he says, I'll see if there's any spots, if there's going to be a spot coming up. So he did, he checked it out, and sure enough, there was, uh, they said, come on and audition here in June after I got my degree. So I, I did, I went there, and uh, and it, it's, it was not like it is today where you see an ad in the International Musician and they say, you know, the, the 
uh, opening it for clarinet. It was more of a, a, not word of mouth so much, but you had to be proactive and contact these different bands, you know, to find out if there was going to be anything coming up. And, and it's often they'd say, no, not yet, but uh, we're going to, I know there's going to be a couple clarinet players or whatever you played, you know, getting out in within six months or so, and maybe there will be then. So anyway, I auditioned and I was successful with that and, and uh, got in. And so they cut your, called cut your papers right there. And then you go to the recruiter and say, here's where I'm going, <laughs> you know, and how do we do that? So you have to go through basic training. The only band that doesn't go through basic training is the Marine band. Everybody else has to go through basic. And so, uh, you know, did that. And then I went and I was at West Point for, for three years. But it was great because I was taking lessons with Leon Rushnoff in New York. And the Army was paying for it. And I was also taking uh, flute lessons from Albert Regney, who's a well-known uh, studio player and, and commercial player in New York. I understand that uh, you and some of your your mates um, grew mustaches as a mild form of protest. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, we did. <laughs> you got to remember, in in that era, you know that many young people did not think it was a good thing what we were doing in Vietnam, and also it was the idea of the draft and. And uh, it was a, a lot, you know, a lot going on and a lot of protests and, you know, marches and all kinds of stuff. And we kind of felt a little strange because we had real short haircuts and everybody else had long hair. So <laughs> immediately they know, you know, if, if we were in an area around West Point, you know, the surrounding area by 20 miles, you know, they, they knew we were in the army, you know? So anyway, yeah, you could have, you could have facial, well, not, not a beard there. Maybe you could do it in the Navy, but at that time you could only have it have uh, mustaches. So we, we grew mustaches and after a while, the, the, the career people started thinking, why are all these young guys <laughs> growing mustaches? <laughs> and, you know, they had to be trimmed a certain way. You couldn't go any longer. This you certainly couldn't go down at all. You know, it had to be. So, yeah, we had a surprise must, uh, mustache inspection one, one day. <laughs> we all had to go down and trim them up, you know. But it was just our little thing, you know, of doing, trying to, you know, yes. saying, hey, we're, we're individuals. <laughs> Well, I'm glad your second trip overseas was not, you know, to go be in a war. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you about uh, Chuck Man Joan. So I'm moving ahead a little bit, and, and you're at Eastman, and Chuck was uh, well known locally. And was he doing like an adjunct position at Eastman at that time? Yeah, he was. He, uh, when I went, uh, Rayburn Wright was also the first uh, year that Ray Wright came. He was came from Radio City Music Hall, where he was the music director of that. He worked what his way up through the arranging ranks and ended up being the, the head musical guy for Radio City. And um, he had been teaching some courses in the summer at Eastman, some arranging courses called the Rangers Workshop. And he was then, he, he thought it was ready for time for him to move from the city and have a little less hectic life. Not less busy though, because you know, you don't go to these jobs to try to retire, you know, because you're building things and, you know, working hard. But anyway, he came to Eastman in 1970, and that was the first year that uh, I was there. And I was uh, assigned as his uh, graduate assistant. 
And so that turned out to be a very good thing. Now, Chuck had been directing the, the jazz ensemble for the previous couple of years. He continued conducting the jazz ensemble at, at, during that time when Ray came. And Ray did all the arranging and those kinds of things and formed the studio orchestra, which was the jazz ensemble with strings. And um, yeah, so Chuck was a, a formidable guy there. We would, he was gaining recognition by, by this time he had his first, I don't know if it was his first one, but the first one that kind of hit that was a big, a big production with strings and everything. And the concert was called Friends in Love. And so all that popularity poured over to us in school and we were, you know, we would, we'd do jazz ensemble concerts and there'd be 3,000 people there. The Eastman Theater would be packed. Now, they weren't charging anything, you know, but still to get 3,000 people for a school show, you know, it was uh, pretty impressive. And so um, that happened and, and, and Chuck uh, continued to gain popularity. And because of that, he started, you know, doing bigger records and doing some tours. And I was lucky to be, uh, to play in, in his uh, expanded group that uh, did tours. We did tours of the East Coast and Midwest. He had me come to California once to do uh, a recording there in, uh, in Herb Alpert's, what is that, a and record? A and M, yeah. A and M, A and M. Yeah, so uh, yeah, and I got to go back home and play in Red Rocks uh, once, you know. So Chuck, it's uh, he liked me and he liked uh, the the things I could do, and uh, because of that, he liked friendly faces in the in the group, you know. And if it was possible, he would uh, help you know, help people out. So there were some other people. I mean, I mean, uh, Jeff Tysick played a lot of uh, these tours too and helped on a lot of the recordings. When, when he did his first uh, Friends in Love and I think it was followed by Together. That's right, yeah. What was the attitude, was there an attitude discernible from the Eastman uh, Philharmonic about this young man who's coming in with these handwritten parts and bringing in an electric bass guitar and that kind of thing. How did that fly? Well, that those first two were done with the Rochester Philharmonic, which is not an Eastman thing, but it's, you know, it's a it's it's a organization in its own right. Okay. But right, they were older, more experienced players. And, you know, it's like anything, you're gonna have people that, you know, raise their nose and think it's, you know, beneath them. And then you're gonna have the other, pe other people that are in favor of it, you know. And it couldn't have been that much pushback because they, they were happy to take the money, okay? <laughs> happy to play the gig and the, the records after that, I think, that weren't done with them. It was, uh, you know, done with other uh, studio type, you know, situations, you know. But um, yeah, there was a little, a little bit, but not too much, right? I, I got to say, even when the jazz department put forth the 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 first degree, it was a master's degree, not a bachelor's. A, a master's in jazz performance and two tracks, one in a performance and one in composition, all thought out and, you know, all the proper things that you're supposed to do for, for these things. But, but there had to be a faculty vote on it. And there were some people that, that voted against it, but it didn't pass, you know, I mean, it didn't fail. So yeah, there were some, 
people around that think thinking if you play jazz, it's going to mess up your classical playing. <laughs> and that doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's a different thing. It's, it's rather stunning. Um, the state of jazz education, how it sort of exploded over the years. And now it's integral part of almost any music school across the country. Yeah, it is. And also the saxophone. I tell you, in, in the 1960s, there was not many places you could study saxophone and get a degree. Joe Farrell, you, you, Monk, you, you know his name, I know. Joe Farrell, who played with yes. uh, Korea and had a, a good career as a, you know, a solo saxophone player. He was a flute major at Illinois. They didn't have saxophone. He couldn't major in saxophone. It was flute. In fact, weren't you the first uh, saxophone professor at Eastman? Yes. Well, the first one with that title. There was uh, 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 a person teaching there who was on uh, was the clar on the clarinet faculty, who who also uh, had several students, not many, but a few, you know. And his name was Bill Osick, and he taught uh, taught that. But I was the first one that had the title of, you know, professor of saxophone. And it was mostly classical, I would imagine. Is that correct? It was, but I, they still had to take classical uh, juries. But um, what we did, we did a lot of jazz, you know, and many of those players from that, from that period are extremely successful <laughs> professional musicians, you know. It didn't hurt him one bit. <laughs> but then, then we got the, the master's degree going and, uh, and there was straight jazz. And then after that came the bachelors of jazz performance and, or jazz composition. And uh, so now we had these kind of two strings or two streams, but I always, just tried to teach the saxophone and then allow the students to des decide what kind of music they wanted to play. When it came time to construct a four-year curriculum for a jazz major, how many people were involved in those decisions about what courses are going to be required, uh, what are things you can choose from, and what was really important? I imagine you were in the middle of that. Well, yeah, but that was, was quite a while ago, <laughs> 30 years probably, you know. But um, I know it was figured out with mainly the, the three of us, Ray Wright, Bill Dobbins, and myself. Now, I, those two guys were full time in on the jazz side of things. I was teaching, uh, you know, one on one saxophone lessons and, and clarinet to begin with, and um, teaching 10 hours of jazz, which was an improvisation course and to direct a band, that kind of thing. Probably a couple of courses, improv courses. So Ray and Bill mainly put it together with my input. And then outside of that, we brought in people from the wind brass percussion department, you know, like uh, John Marcellus on trombone and the trumpet people and the people that would be influenced, you know, would be affected by this. And then we had to find some, you know, some people who were who were um, sympathetic on rhythm section kind of instruments. Not that they would teach it, but they just have to, you know, say, "Hey, that's okay, and it's a thing to do." And yes, it's fine. So we 
we got friends. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we talked to him, and you know, and and uh, when it came time for, well, I said the first time we had that undergrad thing, not everybody voted for it. It wasn't unanimous, but it got it got you know, it got started. So the main thing is, uh, start. We started with a small group, expanded it out, made friends, and and told them what we were doing. And, and by then, the quality was really, really high. And you can't, you can't argue with that, you know. If the example is extremely high and these guys are doing things, I mean, the theory people would say, man, we love these jazz guys when they come in to the theory. You know, they're just, they do so well. You know, they were really, supportive you know and then there's a there was a a couple of uh or at least one musicologist no he uh he was theory yeah but he was a, a pianist the jazz, jazz old jazz piano player but you know that had done it and uh so he was really on top of it he ended up teaching a, a course on on bill evans it was very popular and really really good you know. I wish I could remember who said this to me, but they pointed out that today's jazz major instrumentalist is much more likely to be able to step into a symphony gig and fill a part rather than the other way around. That an orchestral musician would have much more trouble going playing Thad Jones and Lewis charts. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, really. Definitely. I have a, speaking of previous interviews, I, I want to read something from two individuals and just get your uh, reaction to it. This is from, from Phil Woods, and I was able to speak to him probably, I've lost track, 15 years or so. And I asked him about advice for young jazz men. And he said, I think jazz is only for those that have no choice. I think if you're a young man and you're entertaining thoughts of becoming a brain surgeon or a jazz tenor man, I'd go with the brain surgery. If you've got two burning desires, don't pick jazz. Don't rush into a jazz school or any, any university. I recommend taking a year off, hitchhike around the world, take your horn and see if you can play for your supper. <laughs> Well, that, that's very good advice, <laughs> really. I think to be, if you just look at it, you know, you can, you can start thinking pretty gloomy things about even being a, a music major, let alone being a jazz musician. But the thing is that if you take your what you do to the highest possible level. And if you are successful, you know, being a really fine player, people recognize that. And they, they will, you know, pay for you to, to play. <laughs> but it's, it's really tough for, the, I mean, some, some of the, the jazz guys going to New York nowadays are, it's not $15 they're playing for, but it's not much more, you know, maybe $50 on, on some of the things, you know, just doing it to, to meet people and get started. I'm talking about guys right out of school. So um, I think what Phil was saying there is that if you want to, if, if you want to be a musician, it has to, call you and you can't think that of doing anything else it really has to be you know this is it i'm doing i'm going for it you know if you had a grandchild who wanted to do it what would you say to them um 
I'd say to them not, uh, first of all, to, and probably wouldn't have, even have to put, push this at all, but no technology, know what's going on and how to get your, how, how the stage is now so much more than just the, the town that you're in or the state that you're in or, or the country that you're in. It's all over the world. And, you know, uh, musicians find good, good work in, in Europe and in, in Asia. You know, China's a good example. I have, geez, I had one guy that came for, he went to Oberlin for his undergrad and then he went to China and he was in Shanghai for, I think, two or three years. Some of his other buddies were there. And they worked. They worked just playing American stuff, you know, for, for Chinese businesses. And then he came back and he was, you know, had all that experience playing and a very fine player. And he got a master's degree and, uh, here and is now down in the DC area. But yeah, he's, he was thinking more of, the world, you know, than just here, you know, just uh, what am I going to do? How can I get another job in Rochester? You know, well, you know, maybe, you know, you got to, you got to get the technology thing happening and, and become a very fine player. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah you, you spoke um, at length about that in, in this marvelous book that I'll that I oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, technology changes so fast that I see you brought on someone to help out with the second edition for that specific purpose. Yes, uh, that's true. Yeah. There's because... a couple things in there that I that I really related to. Um, you mentioned about there's no lack of great players and you could have two people who you could hire that played equally well, that could both fulfill the task. And you said, make sure you don't act like a jerk because no one's going <laughs> to, no one's going to pick you, even if you play really well. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. People, re people recommend people who are, good players and who are friends of theirs. It's just, it's just just normal. You know, why have to, why do you hire somebody and think that, oh man, is this guy gonna show up, <laughs> you know? Or will there be some, you know, some incident that'll happen, you know? Or is he can, can go with the flow and, you know, not, not cause a scene. Mm -hmm. But there are, yeah, you mentioned earlier before we started taping here that uh, about Legos and, and Legos are things I, I talk about, like things that you learn in life and how you take these Legos and you put them together and you build a career. And if you get to, if you, the great thing about it is if you build something and then you say, mm, I don't, it's not looking too good. I need to build a little more over here. So you, you can craft this thing to fit you, or you can you knock the whole thing down and start over. You know, but so to me, Legos are uh, things you can you can do. You know, you you, you play certain pieces on your instrument. You um, have gained experience playing in bigger ensembles and orchestras and st that kind of thing. Um, but there are also personality Legos that help you. And uh, one of those things is, is uh, being personable with, you know, with others. You have to, learn, not... how to, you have to learn how to hang. That's right. You gotta get the hang down. <laughs> I think that should be a course at Eastman, Hang 101. Yeah. Boy, I tell you, when I was younger, we used to, I could have taught it easily. <laughs> um, b before I forget, uh, 
I was looking at the course listing uh, at Eastman for a four-year degree, and it reminded me of um, something Harry Sweets Edison said. Uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Nowadays, it seems like musicians have their idols, and they don't venture any place else. It's better to be the world's worst originator than the world's greatest imitator. So mm. my question, I guess, is because jazz has playing, improv, improvising has been so codified and so much information, the people from Sweet's generation over and over said, everybody sounds the same. Mm -hmm. How do you think players can avoid that? Mm. Yeah, I think it's something you can't force, you know. And, you know, if everybody is more or less doing, practicing the same stuff, that's gonna, you know, I mean, it, it, you get out what's put in. And if, 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 if you all are more or less the same, same putting the same stuff through you, you know, the same play along records as, you know, that's, that's how you, well, I mean, we have it, it happens in America. I mean, we can go into certain, certain, uh, we could be in Idaho someplace and go into a shopping mall and see the same stores there as we have here, you know? So that's, that's, it's happening that way too. But I think what you, what you do is have to forge your own, you take your own background and experience and, and make that into something that's you. And that means being, I, I tell students, you know, okay, you're here at Eastman, don't just be, have it jazz, jazz, jazz all day. Know that, you know, there's a world-class singers that you can hear. There's, you can hear some, you know, go to an opera, go to a, an orchestra concert, go to the new music people, go to the gamelan, check that stuff out, you know, and, or uh, the ethno, the, you know, the ethnomusicology kind of uh, uh, series that they have at school. And try to, I had one, one, one guy that was so really good, really into cannonball and he just cannonball, cannonball, cannonball. And I finally said, you got to turn the page. You can't stay on this all, all time. <laughs> you know, you got it. Go on to the next thing. <laughs> I'm cracking up because if you look over my shoulder, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, but that's Cannonball Adderley. Uh, so. <laughs> and he's been my guy for... Uh -huh. And I saw him actually um, in Rochester a number of times. And I just, I mean, it's not the only person I listen to, but for me, he had everything I wanted from a uh -huh. saxophone player. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Stan Getz was my guy, mm -hmm. you know, so. I want to ask you about um, some of the other Legos that you've been able to construct and arranging and composing. Can you tell me where, first of all, let's talk about arranging. If, if you got a commission or you heard a tune that you wanted to arrange, let's say for jazz ensemble, how do you go about thinking of a different way to set it so that you're not just producing mm -hmm. the original recording? Where do those yeah. thoughts come from? Well, I don't know. That <laughs> I... I just 
to start humming stuff, <laughs> you know, to tell you the truth, <laughs> you know, what could it be, you know, I can't think of an example off the top of my head right now, but um, you have to, there's got to be a reason that you do a, 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 an arrangement. Let's say I got get to choose the tune that I want to do. There's got to be a reason that I cho choose that tune. What am I going to bring to that tune that hasn't been done umpteen million times before? You know, what can I, what can I do? So I think about it that way. And usually I, it, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm humming those type of things in my head before I get to, hey, I think maybe I'll do an arrangement of that. You know, I don't, I don't think first, I find a title in something. Although sometimes that happens, they say do an arrangement on so and so, you know, and then you have got to make it fit to uh, them, you know, fit the, the person who's asking for it. But that's a difficult question. I don't know exactly how, you know, how, how that goes. That's okay, because I think that's sort of the magic of what makes people successful is, is they come up with things and they can't explain why, but that's what makes them unique. Do, do you ever get ideas away from a piano or away from, you know, okay, I'm doing music now, but sometimes ideas may come at other times. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, just riding in the car or something, you know, just thinking of a bass line or something like that, you know. I know people that, that try to write them down is, you know, as soon as they can and just have a little notebook. of. In fact, I kept a notebook for a long time just called Ideas. And I just write stuff down or, you know, just it could be a thing. Big band chart on so-and-so, you know, just stuff like that. And then I'd come back to that and, and look at it and said, oh, yeah, that that could work. And I then I'd go ahead and sketch it out and go from there. You obviously were in the era of using score pads, and I'm wondering if you transitioned to Finale or Sibelius. And you know, actually, I was in a colleague of yours, Dave Ravello's music mm -hmm. room, and I was pleasantly surprised to see this big table with a huge pad on it and pencils. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he, he insisted it was important to do the physical yeah. act of putting a note on a piece of paper. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I do both, do it both ways. I sketch, sketch stuff and, you know, figure out things on the piano. And then I, uh, I use finale also and, and, you know, put it in and I got, got pretty good on and finale and, and pretty fast. And I could, because I was in, I, every summer I'd go to Germany and I was in charge of the Eastman Philharmonia. And they had a gig there playing it in Heidelberg at the castle there. And uh, I didn't have a piano, so I had the, you know, just the computer. And uh, I edited a whole bunch of books and stuff. And I did a lot of editing for my publisher, Advanced Music. And so I got pretty fast at this. But then I got more of an administrative job at, at Eastman around uh, year 2000. And uh, it sort of worked into that, a thing that I developed, the Institute for Music Leadership. And so I didn't write any music for a long time. And man, I lost my chops. I, I had to come, come back to it. And by then, it, <laughs> Finale had moved on and I was still back here like in a stagecoach, you know, and, and there driving cars, you know. So it was, uh, you gotta keep your chops up there too. Indeed. Some of the, uh, I, I, you mentioned putting strings in your book, strings on a car commercial or something like that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have any memories of not necessarily terrible gigs, but just oddball assignments that you might have taken on 
working with producers or radio people, ad men, those kinds of things, and the odd things that they would ask for? Oh, I can think of one I remember. It was around Thanksgiving a long time ago, and, and it was on the Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, and, and uh, myself and Jeff Tysick and a couple other guys had to go to down to New York at this real fancy place, fancy recording studio. I can't remember the name of it now, but it was, I know they were paying a lot of money for it. And we, it was a, they were making a bumper, a little five second bumper that was going to be on ABC, you know, just, just a short little da 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 da, something like that, you know. But out of that, there was also writing a. It was gonna. They were gonna take this bumper out of uh, a, a longer piece, and so the rhythm section had already been done. Okay, the tracks were there, and we were, were the horns. And man, we got going, and this lady had her 12 year old son there too. And she started asking him things, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I found, she, I got the one thing from her. She says, I wanna, I, I just want the feeling that I'm in my car in a convertible and I'm just driving a country road and the wind's in my air. <laughs> it's just a beautiful day. And we're going, you know, banging our heads against it. Does that mean, <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean softer or louder? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it was so we couldn't translate what was going on. Even I just re ridiculous. She's one thing she says. She said, "Do you have a cello?" <laughs> you know, like we can, did. We do you see a cello in here? <laughs> no. <laughs> it was crazy. Meanwhile, the clock is running right. It was running for them, yeah, and for us, you know. I mean, we got paid well, but it was, they, they just didn't, didn't know, you know. How about a gig that you've played that uh, either you recall as being the absolute Mount Everest of gigs or the uh, exact opposite, like, this is such a train wreck. Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't know. So let's see. I think some of the things I did with Chuck were really good because there were so many people there. Like the Red Rocks concert was really good. Red Rocks in Colorado. And, uh, you know, I made a special trip to, to be there to play that, or he had me come out. And so... Uh, that was really good, just because of the electricity that was going on. And actually, the, the other ones that we did in various places with Chuck, you know, we did them in big halls on in Boston and New York, Carnegie Hall in New York and, and uh, DC. So um, those things were, were very, very big. But I tell you, you know, I've when things are really going, I get the chills. I can feel it, you know. And I've had it happen, you know, when I was directing the uh, the lab band at, at Eastman, the third band, you know. And when they were playing, geez, I remember one concert, I just, wow, just got knocked out. When I was at Michigan State, I had to be, to get have a scholarship in the fall, I had to play in the marching band. I remember one time of that stupid marching band, you know, just getting the chills, playing, playing the stuff that we were playing for, you know, 80,000 people. Yeah. So it happens, happens, you know, like it happens in playing in an orchestra, you know, just uh, like playing Miraculous Mandarin by Bartok, you know, I, really get, mm, this is great.
Yeah, to sit in the middle of all that. Um, I wonder if you've ever had the experience of playing specifically a sax a saxophone in an orchestra. The reason I'm asking is this happened to me once. Uh, I, believe, I believe the piece was by a uh, fellow named Honegger. Mm -hmm. And there was an alto sax part. And of course, the part required you to sit there for probably 80 bars and then come in. And of course, it's a solo. Yeah. And it wasn't the kind of music that you could just feel where you are. Like, have a, mm -hmm. oh dear, is this measure 49 or is it 50 of my rests? Yeah. Is something that ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's happened. But uh, that's part of the deal. That, that happens in uh, Rachmaninoff symphonic uh, dances. You know, there's a, the only thing the alto saxophone does is play a play a solo. It's in a bunch of sharps, and uh, you you play it at about I don't know about ten minutes into the piece. So you're there, and your reed is dried out. Could could have or lost suction. You know, you never know what's going to happen there. But I tell you, one of the the roughest things. The Pictures at an Exhibition was written by Mussorgsky, okay? And it was the most famous version, the orchestration of it is by Ravel. That's the one that everybody knows. And that's the one that has the big saxophone solo in it. Uh, it's uh, the old castle. So the thing is, this Mussorgsky piece has been arranged probably, well, I think I heard the numbers 25 times. So one of the conductors, uh, our main conductor had the idea, we're gonna do the pictures, pictures at an exhibition, but we're gonna mix and match the, the <laughs> various variations. And he took about four or five or maybe six composers and put them in. Okay, so the saxophone, um, normally you play alto saxophone, nice melodic thing, it's great, it's a great solo. The part I had, had to play on soprano saxophone was a trumpet part, and it goes like this. That kind of thing like that, keep them going. This is on a soprano sax. I think it starts on a high C or something, you know. And so I'm telling you, that was a killer, <laughs> absolute killer. <laughs> and I was really nervous about that. But uh, I blew it the first time around. I played it so fast because the trumpet players usually play it real fast. And I talked to the conductor and I said, I'm sorry, I got way ahead. And he said, I said, uh, I thought it, you know, we'd be going faster. And he says, oh, the trumpets just like to play it fast to get through it. <laughs> you know? He said, we're going to go slower. <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's a lot of pressure on, on you. And that's, that's the way it is, you know. That whole mindset um, of playing exactly what someone else has written and and being in a jazz world is i don't have an exact comment except it's such a different way of being in your head yeah it is but uh, yeah there's different rules there's different rules if you know if you crack a note in a jazz thing it's not that big a deal you know but you crack a note in the, in the middle of a legit so so but it's it's pretty big <laughs> so it's, i like it's the way i'd like the way you you started your book um lessons from a streetwise professor with this bit about uh, goals and i remember being at fredonia and the jazz guys were sort of their own club and we all wanted to make it and i remember that phrase but i don't remember 
being really aware of what that meant to us. We just wanted to make it. And you addressed that. Can, can you speak about that a little bit? Mm, geez, I can't remember what I said about it. But... Well, it was like, what means the most to you? Uh, making a lot yeah. of money, working with underprivileged kids or? Sure. Yeah, what, what is the big deal for you? Well, in my own case, I'll just say that when I started off in, in college, you know, I wanted to, to be a, a, I thought if I could teach a high school band in Denver, that'd be the greatest thing in the world, you know, and that's what I thought of doing. But as along the way, I met people and, you know, and, and, and one thing led to another, you know, another opportunity came up. But um, I think the thing, Monk, that you're uh, referring to is that if you think you want to be, okay, when you're first out of school, planning a cruise ship might be good, okay? It might be fun. But, you know, when you're 55 years old or so and you're looking like, oh, wow, man, I may retire in a while, it's not that cool, you know. And so the, I think, you know, that the goalposts, you kind of move the goalposts as you get, as you grow up and, and learn more and get more experience and, and, uh, you know, kind of adjust the, the rudder to make sure you're still moving ahead. I think, I think the goal should be to whatever really, really makes you happy. It could be finding a, 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 a mate, you know, hopefully that ha that'll happen in, uh, you know, as well as <laughs> finding a good job, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not, not really zeroing in on that very well. That's, that's <laughs> fine. Um, and the, the opportunities for graduating jazz musicians are obviously different than they were 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Well, they weren't great 20 or 30 years ago either, you know, it's... The thing I, I think is that if you have many different things that you, that you can do and do at a high level, you can have more options. Okay. And that's the name of the game, you know, having some options. And jazz people, I mean, you know, I'd say 95% of people who call themselves jazz musicians also teach. It's just part of the deal. You know, if you're going to be a jazz guy, you know, you, they generally write tunes too, and you know, know how to how to orchestrate them, and and uh, so there are many things you can do just in that area, and and your writing it helps your playing, and your playing helps your writing. It all goes together. And some of them still play Girl from Ipanema at dance gigs, too. I know. <laughs> it's so yeah. funny that you guys know anything Latin, if you get a request, 90% of the time, it's Girl from Ipanema. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Which has has to have the strangest bridge of, of any tune that, that at least I know. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> So you wrote that you're kind of sort of retired. And yeah. <laughs> how do you fill your time these days? Oh, what I do is, um, yeah. If it's in the summer, I'm working outside a lot. <laughs> I've got a chainsaw yeah. and that kind of thing, you know. But um, I still, with COVID, I thought, okay, this kind of is, stopped everything because the gigs gigs just stopped and so i looked and geez a year and a half and i hadn't practiced anything but then a couple of um 
a, a one broad, Broadway show is coming that I'm going to play, and it's just clarinet. And I thought, okay, that'll be good. I'll do. I'll do this. You know, it's uh, My Fair Lady. It's an old, old time thing. I mean, old, old ty uh, type of scoring. You know, that has four woodwinds, which you heart you had never have anymore. Usually have one guy playing everything. So anyway, I'm working on clarinet you know, get my chops back up and I'm, I'm helping uh, a friend of mine. I'm, I'm playing through his, uh, he's writing a soprano saxophone piece. And uh, I'm, you know, playing through that and helping him out on it and, you know, doing those kinds of things. And then just, uh, just general being retired. It's kind of nice. This is my um, test your memory a little bit. You know the Stanley Theater in Utica? Yeah. Well, I have an inside source that said that you once played Santa at the Stanley Theater in Utica. I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the clarinet playing Santa. <laughs> another Lego piece. Yeah, another Lego piece. And not only that, once I conducted the, the Utica Symphony <laughs> there. And uh, uh, yeah, I think it was a holiday concert. It was, it was a holiday concert. That was, uh, I guess they liked me so much as Santa. They had. <laughs> you didn't know you were auditioning. <laughs> no. But what's, what's really interesting is I played that, that same place. It wasn't uh, renovated at the time, but I played that the Stanley Theater with Chuck Mangione and his, uh, and I must have been with the Utica, you know, symphony, you know, but it, a whole bunch of us came, went down and played. And my wife was playing second oboe at the time she was in high school. <laughs> she ended up being, being my wife. <laughs> and so we didn't know, but we were on the same, same stage in whenever it was, 1971, I don't know. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, you've had a terrific career and um, I've enjoyed this conversation so much. And I wish okay. you continued, uh, continued activity and creativity. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still... I'm, I'm thinking of getting back, getting the old finale going here and doing some stuff, you know, got some ideas and things I want to try. So, well, I have a saxophone ensemble here who'd be glad to read anything you write. Okay. That's <laughs> good. Well, thanks very much for asking me, Monk. I appreciate right. it. Thanks. I'm going to sign off and then we'll uh, yeah. say our goodbyes. Okay.